Okay. I'll tell you what. So I just revised that. So I've now set the one, one alarm for uh, 20 minutes. Andre? Ready? I'm yeah, going for 20 minutes after that. The program co-hosted by myself, Andre Lopez Turner and Juan Toledo in association with Extraradio Uno.com and ztrradio.podomatic.com welcomes back into the studio Stuart Taylor to talk about decolonization part two. Specifically, we're going to get into the intellectual heavyweight of the subject um, called Nelson Maldonado. Uh, Maldonado Torres, Maldonado Torres, Maldonado Torres, um, who has written 10 theses on decolonization and as I said is an intellectual heavyweight of the subject but um, just introducing Stuart, he is a Qigong teacher, an Aikido master, a systemic constellations consultant and a polymath of other things but um, on this matter, you're also a authority, so thank you very much for coming in. It's a and, pleasure. Um, Thanks for the uh, As I said, we are going to uh, eventually chip off the 10 theses. We may get two, hopefully, or three tonight, who knows? But um, yeah, so where do we start with more specific of Maldonado Torres? Where do we start okay. with? Okay, well, I think there's. Um, a really simple but comprehensive opening that I could offer quoting Maldonado Torres. So if you're happy, I'll just dive in with that. <laughs> and um, it runs like this. Colonization and decolonization, as well as coloniality and decoloniality, are increasingly becoming key terms for movements that challenge the predominant racial, sexist, homo and transphobic, conservative, liberal and neoliberal politics of today. So that's quite chunky. Yeah, that, chunky. That's quite dense. I tell you what, uh, of that statement is the word liberal. Yeah. Not neoliberal, but the word liberal. Absolutely. And, and the context of the word liberal in a country like the United States, mm -hmm. we have to understand that for the America, the word liberal. It's, a, it's almost a kind of socialist or yeah. a, a person which is blocked basically. Uh, it goes against many of these sort of kind of traditional orthodox values yes. of some of American right wing society. Yeah. Well, I think that that can be argued not just in the case of North America, but in large swathes of Europe, yeah. in large parts of Asia and of course here in the UK and in a way one of the arguments around colonization, coloniality and decoloniality is the way in which we are all enmeshed in this neoliberal culture, this neoliberal ideology and economy as if it were the only possible position as if it was the only possible set of relations both between people, between nations and between humans and the other than human world. Absolutely right. Uh, we did a show called What Kind of Liberal Are You? We, we looked at you know the difference between a social liberal mm -hmm. and an economic liberal. Right. And you know, the consensus is economically the ruling class, left and right, are economic liberals. But just to jump on that, mm. sorry, just a brief interruption. No, that's um, good. That's good. To, you, um, when you just said what you said, it reminded me of a concept which was thrown around when uh, neoliberalism was getting challenged a little bit in the early infancy of it in the 90s, Tina. The acronym TINA. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative. Indeed. And um, all neoliberal countries that were very heavy on the ideology, all leaders repeated that. Mm -hmm. There is no alternative, was yeah. Tony Blair's big uh, phrase, Bill Clinton's, mm -hmm. and other people. So 
It's just interesting because you're varying, we, we are varying to, there are alternatives, but decolonization is about alternatives, would you say? And sorry, just one more quick. Yeah. When we talk about Nelson Maldonado, I'm, I'm not pronouncing his name. Maldonado. Maldonado. Maldonado Torres tonight. We're talking about a Mexican man, aren't we? We are. Well, he's an, academic, an American academic who, from Mexican origin. So he, okay. he is in the American academic circuit, basically. Yeah. So, you know, and outside the, the mainstream. To some extent. I mean, yeah. some of his um, work has been in looking at um, Hispanic and Caribbean studies. So he has a very clear insight into the formation and the maintenance of Hispanic cultures in South America and also into the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And of course, those cultures as we understand them and can experience them today are the result of centuries of European influence. In a general sense and in a specific sense, they're the result of the um, the meeting between the indigenous pre-Christian, pre-European cultures and the impact of the colonial Christian-led cultures that came to the Americas from Europe. Because there was no alternative, right? So far as <laughs> they were concerned. Well, yeah, decolonization is putting out there as a thesis yes. that there are plenty of alternatives. Absolutely, absolutely. But there's also, there's also certain, um, how can I say, dichotomy, certain dialectic, like certain tension, for example, in a country like the United States with Hispanics. Mm. In this sense, uh, you got the, in, in the statement that you read by Maldonado Torres, he talks about this white neoliberal class that yeah. could, could be like the paradigm of that in the government that we have nowadays in power, mm. particularly with somebody like Trump, but even in this country, somebody like Boris Johnson. But the, the reality is this, the United States is the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the world, the second, right. after Mexico. Yes. It has about 65 million of Hispanic, you know, people speaking Spanish. So there's a process of recolonizing the United States being done by the yeah, Latinos. Absolutely. Uh, so these tensions also exist. I mean, uh, it is part of the process. I mean, it, and it's colonized with music, with people, with language, mm -hmm. for all matters and purposes. You food. know, food, indeed. Food, you know, just coming here, I just noticed Latino bites, new right. cafe, yeah, indeed. But, but the thing is, uh, for all matters and purposes, um, uh, the, 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 the United States, you know, is becoming a bilingual country. Yes. And, and that's a part of the tension comes from that. It's sort of kind of neoliberal thing. It's sort of kind of a kickback, so, so to speak, through this process of being colonized. But, but well, anybody who knows the story, just to, to finish this point, mm -hmm. the story, for example, the story of the expansion of the United States, Mexico was taken from the United States, it was many, many large parts of you know, Arizona, New Mexico, mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. The word California appears in a Spanish novel that Cervantes mentions in Quixote. It's a Spanish name, California. Right. All those, all those missionaries, all those cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the Spanish names, mm -hmm. funded by who? By Jesuits, you know, getting into the land of the native Indians. And remember, the Jesuits were not the like, the Jesuits were Catholics. Right. The Jesuits were translating languages. The Jesuits were the first people to translate from Nahuatl into Spanish. Okay. Poetry from the Mayas and poetry from, poetry from the Aztecs. Something that the, that the, that the um, Protestants didn't do in the United States. If you look at the Protestants, it's an expansion of an expansion of white colonizers from the east to the west. Yes. With the elimination, with the elimination um, of the Indian populations or the land that belongs to the Indians. And if anybody wants to, as I think, they can type into something called a map of the United States in the in the 1840s, 1850s. And what they are gonna find is a huge region belongs to the Indians. Right. By definition belongs to the Indians. Yes. But they obviously that wasn't observed. It was a person with expansionism yes. within the United States. Absolutely, and, and we have seen comparable expansions throughout the world where the European imperialist expansionist project held sway.
So to come back to uh, Maldonado Torres, his first thesis states that colonialism, decolonization, and related concepts generate anxiety and fear. So what he's talking about, as I understand it here, is the notion that predominant attitudes in the dominant culture that are challenged necessarily generate some measure of anxiety and even fear because although we are notionally enmeshed in this set of political and economic and social relations as if they were permanent, as if they had never been any other way, actually that isn't the case. So what the raising of the issues of, of colonialism and decolonization generates is an anxiety it's it's and the anxiety is around the uh in a way the the good faith or the bad faith in which members of a dominant population carry out their lives at some level there's an understanding there's a knowledge that in order for the levels of privilege that they enjoy to be perpetuated somewhere other people have to be um, quashed however you want to think about that whether that's through legal process whether that's through extrajudicial processes whether that's militarily or whether that's through the media and other groups being marginalized to begin to come into consciousness and awareness of that being a fundamental reality rather than the um, brand driven entertainment consumption oriented reality is challenging. What I think is, for example, um, I think it, to think in the Marxist terms, you would think about this colonization. Is an expansion of a way of life, a way of life of privileged white Christian people around the world. Mm -hmm. You could argue in the same vein that what's happened with the Muslim world, that the Muslim world is the last bastion resisting that westernization of products and goods and American or Western way of life. Yes. Okay. The, the role of the army here is to create more consumers, to guarantee the creation and the sustainability of more consumers. Yes. So if a country is going to go not the way that capitalism world or the multinationals mm -hmm. want, it has to be quashed yes. or bombed to yes. start with, or yes. invaded, or whatever. Absolutely. You know, and it has been the, the modus operandi for years. What seems to me now, and we talked about this previously, is that because of the ecological crisis, this model has started to kind of fall apart completely. I, I was reading an article really in the Guardian three weeks ago with Larry Elliott, with the you know the, um, the economic uh, editor of the Guardian. He was claiming that the, 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 the kind of the free market as we know it is coming to an end. It has come to an end because, um, uh, well, uh, basically, basically because the countries that dominate dominate the market for so many years are no longer the dominating countries. Indeed. So basically, we have got countries like China now yeah. and India. Yeah. So we've got different players. Absolutely. Now, the, this term of decolonization would be an interesting one to see when we, we are confronted with China yes. and the way China operates around the world. Indeed. And ha China has a different, a, different, a different models. I mean, China is a capitalistic, state-controlled society because it's, it's, it's capital. It, they are yes. capital. No and, question. Yeah, and then we have a different model. So, what I'm trying to say to you is that these, these concepts of colonization are changing constantly. The yes. terms are was constantly changed because of the economic and financial realities and social realities of the world. Absolutely, and, and I want to be really clear in, um, in framing our dialogue around Maldonado Torres' ten theses. Firstly, this is not the definitive model of coloniality and decolonization. It is one model. The reason I think it's valuable is because it is contentious, it is challenging. However comprehensive his um, 
argument is, however comprehensive his thesis is, he himself states, this is provisional, it's iterative. In a way, when we're in the business of culture and analyzing culture, researching culture, we're adding to the culture. So culture is permanently, in a way, evading us. Yeah. And we're, we're almost only ever grasping the vapor trail. It's already moved. By the time we found a way to frame it, to name it, in inverted commas, contain it, it's elsewhere. So I just want to be very clear that this is in no way prescriptive, okay. but it's a very incisive and articulate framing of this dynamic process, which is absolutely... It's a living document. It's a living document, and the process is a dynamic process. Politics, economics, yeah. is a dynamic yeah, yeah. process. Um, but one of the in interesting things that he goes on to say here is that... Um, you know, the, the question, or even raising the question around colonization and decolonization is a challenge because of the almost willful sleepwalking of the values and the benefits and the relative stability of a particular neoliberal system. So it does cause, uh, you know, in a way it's like Maybe we could use the analogy or the metaphor of tectonic plates shifting. You know, this is a fact, this is empirical. We have these physical plates on the Earth's crust mm -hmm. are moving, and they have their corresponding physical influence in the world. So it's, a, it's not like for like, but as an, 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 an analogy, your reference of the rise of China the rise of India. I mean, we, we're, we're familiar already with the acronym of the BRIC countries, mm. Brazil, Russia, Russia India, yeah, China. Okay, yeah. But there's a, a secondary grouping referred to as the mint economies, which is Malaysia, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. So these are very substantial populations, and all of them share very diverse political, historical, faith-based perspectives on the world. So I think this century is a century whereby, where the people who would consider themselves to be progressives or otherwise, who might choose to engage in this process, the process is taking place because these cultural, economic, and social and political tectonic plates are already shifting. But yeah, yeah, okay. Well, Sorry. yeah, I mean, I just, it just comes to me, um, live and direct. When you, when you, if we talk about China and we just talk about the mint countries yes. and the brick countries, but then we talk about globalization, mm -hmm. the, the neoliberals, the West have created the World Trade Organization, which is Indeed. basically America, it's 80 odd percent of them. But they've invited the people in to play the game. On their terms. That's what I was just about to say. Yeah. They particularly, they invited the Chinese into the World Trade Organization. Why? Because they're increasing their market share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, however, it is on their terms and you know the the trade war conflict between china and america is very much on this and as we know and possibly even hong kong as we speak absolutely it's hong like, kong is a flashpoint hong kong is a litmus yeah so how do we play the game and you know like it's it is a, such an interesting uh, process i mean i'm halfway through a book on genghis khan genghis khan yeah. And it's fascinating because it's called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. And it's saying that you know, he was an amazing leader mm -hmm. because he, he obliterated a lot of traditional mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. like he got rid of aristocracy, he put in meritocracy, he respected everyone, um, different cultures, he hybridized stuff, so he was kind of interested in other cultures, what they had to offer and what they could do. Um, but he also took away a lot of tribal conflict Okay. Yeah, he took away a lot of that by, and I can't quite remember how he did it, but he, um, 
Yeah, he got rid of the old games of my tribe's going to try and invade and kill yours. It's like with some weird Mongolians. Right. Get rid but of he did it with an army, this kind of thing. I mean, yeah, and, but his armies were structured very differently and um, very progressively. Mm. But actually, if we go back to that point of, you know, the subject, um, you know, we are in, you know, they like to talk about the world economy, the globalisation. And so we have a melting pot, for the better word, of cultures in in the game, but it's how it's being played. And then obviously inside countries, I mean, we all live in London, it's completely different from living outside of, uh, in other parts of the UK. Absolutely. Um, so in that respect, the... Economics um, part in this. I think and it's a huge part. I think the economics plays a huge, enormous part in it. I, think, I do think that, in certain ways, we are referring to in, in the 20th century was center and periphery, and the center was basically the West, sustained by the Americans, and the periphery was the other countries, um, Latin America, Africa, even Asia. Now, with the rise of Asia, the, the centers start to move, mm. but the tectonic plates, and I don't even you, you, you mentioned there. But I do think that. The problem is that we are all following the same system. China is a capitalist model. Well, India is a capitalist model too. We are, we are, we are. It's hard to interrupt. We are. Yeah. But I can remember acutely, without sounding like a travel snob, being in Peru and reading something along the lines of the indigenous don't fit into the model and they don't want to fit into the model and it's a problem. Yeah. What do you do with because they're not yeah. playing the game. Yeah, right. exactly. And what do we do with them? Do we get rid of them? Do we exterminate them? Seriously, they're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, if they're in the Amazon, you know, we can leave them there. But as we know, people certain uh, people want to go after the Amazon. So, you know, it's a, you know, these kind of, you know, who, who's in the game, how they're going to play it, etc. And I think, was it, is it where he's still on thesis number one? Yeah. Something about, there's a thing about who can and cannot question this. Absolutely. And if you question this, you could be an uppity Colombian, yeah. you know, a, well, this is very a stroppy Antipodean, Indeed. you know, a, um, a, a problematic Maori fellow, Indeed. Um, so you know, all of these, wound up Caribbean bloke. So all of these you ways know, of othering and a, a framing yeah. a, a, yeah. a voice and a position that's counter point to the mainstream ideology. Mm. This is part of what Maldonado Torres refers to, in effect, as the war yeah. that is constantly being waged, yeah. literally through military interventions. I tell you, I tell you what, just interrupt, just, just with the names of things, just very, very uh, a footnote. I like the name that a French, uh, famous French poet, Charles Baudelaire, used mm -hmm. to. Uh, these kind of people, the oh, irregular right. vegetable. Right. Sorry. The irregular <coughs> vegetable. The irregular vegetable. Well, we can look at that in a you know in a very um, prosaic way <laughs> when we think about okay, well, how do we get our heads around the um, practical, concrete manifestation of this movement, this uh, process of colonization. Well, let's go to a major mainstream supermarket and look at the nature of the vegetables. Yeah. There are no irregular vegetables. It's, it's indeed, indeed. The irregular yeah, vegetables yeah. are the, pulp. The ugly tomato that is not there. The tomato has to be the, the tomato, tomato has, the has to be carrots, red, beautifully the turnip, looked, yeah. whatever it what might be. What are the green and yellow tomatoes that you find in South America? You don't find them here. Yeah. So uh, well, you know, Max and Spencer's and Sainsbury's is the great George Monbiot has written about yeah. dictate to the farmers. Well, exactly. Yeah. But it's also, they say it's coming from the consumer. Well, I don't know Supposedly, that no. is necessarily um, a dictat from my household or yours or Juan's for that matter. Yeah. So, so in, in a kind of funny, but at the same time serious way, it's a very easy um, illustration of how this neo-colonialism carries on, yeah. hidden in plain sight. Mm. You know, how much are the producers being squeezed into conformity? How many farmers that have perhaps 
had farming as their industry for generations being squeezed out of that marketplace. At one level, you can argue this is a natural development and evolution within capitalism, the, the ongoing diversification of products and services. But at what cost? Not just at what human cost, but at what environmental cost. So this leads us in to the second of our uh, very abbreviated engagements with Maldonado Torres' ten theses. Um, the second thesis, so coloniality is different from colonialism and decoloniality is different from decolonization. Okay, how does he define coloniality? Okay, well we're going to get straight into that. So. If the first thesis addresses the context and attitudes that one finds when posing the questions of the meaning and significance of colonialism and decolonization, this second thesis provides a basic conceptual differentiation and clarification. So this is uh, how Maldonado Torres is coming to this. So in this context, challenges the uh, constitutive systemic elements that exist in the colonial project. So invariably, colonialism is perceived as being something that has happened. It's an historical phenomenon. We are now in a post-colonial era. Well, that may be the case in so far as Policy documentation, um, or your methodology, maybe agreements between states, between former colonies and former colonizing states. But then we have to think of the infrastructure and the apparatus of the state. So, although officially colonialism is over, we are in an era of neo-colonialism and coloniality, which is the shadow this now implicit, hidden in plain sight, the language we can use, the ways in which we can travel, the currencies we can use, whether or not indigenous peoples or um, marginalized cultural groups, whether here in Europe or in Asia or in Africa or in the Americas or in Polynesia, where do you see those represented within the hierarchy? whether that's governmental, business, or even in the third sector, where do you see representations of Europeans or North Americans impoverished? Those images are not available to us in the most part. Those representations are a perpetuation of the model of the other, of the subaltern, the incapacity, the inability to, to exercise sovereignty and self-efficacy. Sure, we could see it. Yeah, I agree with some of those statements. Uh, we could also see it as a grand narrative, the grand narrative Absolutely. that has been imposed. Exactly. And that what we have to do is about to decode that narrative and subvert it. I think that's one of the first elements. That, for example, is America, is the United States of America an empire? Yes, it is an empire. Indeed. They will not say it to you, but America, the United States as it is, is a, an empire. By the number of military bases they go, they go around the world, and the and how those military bases allow the American products to globalize, to basically accept, to create new consumers. Absolutely. You know, the army exists for a reason. It's no, there's, there's a hierarchy of aggression. Indeed. That, that is a, it's an aggression, and that aggression comes yeah. economically, culturally, linguistically, in many, many ways, financially. Absolutely. So, but the thing is the grand narrative. So part of the, the beauty of the internet and things like that is having that opportunity, even a program like this, having the opportunity to speak in another way, things which are not spoken, even through the main media. Which is I, I agree, I agree. I mean, I think that at one level, many members, intentionally or unwittingly, of the mainstream across the piece from education, government, third sector, industry, 
are effectively apologists for the, this grand narrative, this meta-narrative. And at some level, it's the role and purpose of, for want of a better term, progressive communities who may or may not have been othered or marginalized historically or in the contemporary era or even, or even the cliched role they have been asked to play within that absolutely, grand absolutely. Uh, so part, yeah. part of their role, part of their means to exercise sovereignty, to exercise self-efficacy, is to actually articulate their lived experience and to find the means and the mechanisms to really be vocal and really be present as a counterpoint to this yeah. grand it's narrative. A, it's a counter narrative. It's, it's exactly that. And the, the, the more scope there is for that to actually occur, the more spaces that are created, the more platforms that become available, the greater those diversification of voices and perspectives and lived histories rather than told histories, yeah. the more present they become, the more substantive they become, the easier gradually it becomes for a wider population to actually begin to imagine there is another way. Yeah. It isn't a case actually that there is no alternative, it's actually the case that there are multiple alternatives. So would you agree with the idea that this decolonization process is starting in the mind, it starts as a kind of an intellectual project almost. It has to start there. Well, I mean, in the way I see it. Last, in the last program we talked about the necessity of doing it because of the ecology, the, the ecological crisis. Absolutely. Will, will soon, very, very soon, will ask us to rethink the idea of progress, the idea of how we consume Indeed. and consumptions and, and an economy is a big part of this process, it's a big it, part of this It's huge, it's huge. In and fact, it's the engine of it. I exactly. And just as we're in a position historically where we're waking up to the very urgent crisis that we face environmentally, yes, there of course is a necessary shift in awareness and consciousness and attitudes and understandings and belief but I think as well as important as that is an emotional response is an emotional reckoning yeah. is an appreciation that there is an emotional impact to pursuing this grand narrative as you've referred to it and increasingly you know, we talk about this concept of um, of uh, fatigue, of um, of charitable fatigue. People are just getting tired of seeing this repetitive cycle of either environmental degradation or extremely impoverished humans in other parts of the world. Indeed. And there's a point, surely, at which we can't ignore the emotional impact this has on us as individuals or as communities. To bring that right home, when we look at the entirely disproportionate reporting on crime amongst young men in the African Caribbean yeah. community, for yeah. example, yeah. here in London especially, but it's more pervasive than London, or when we think about or look at the reported statistics on um, rape cases that are actually taken through to the, the, the full judicial process, these might seem very disparate and inconsequential illustrations, but actually what they're illustrating, whether we're talking about these um, non-strange fruits and vegetables, or whether we're talking about young men and their early violent deaths, or whether we're talking about 
the hugely disproportionate number of women that report rape cases but are not actually properly um, supported through the judicial process, they're all pinpoints of a wider systemic, I would almost choose to use the term malaise. We're in a flux. This is an inflection point in our wider culture, our wider political economy. Uh, political, I mean that point. I think that that's another element. Yeah. Uh, but the political representation. Absolutely. And the political legitimacy of that. Legitimacy. Yes. So, yes. And, and then, then you could the cases, of, for example, the people who sustain power right now in certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And are they first legitimate? Probably not, Indeed. in the way they have been in power. Yes. Are they representative? Probably no, certainly not for many, many people. Mm -hmm. However, they sustain power. Yes. And that power allows them to perpetuate this kind of narrative. So you've got a political element there which is very, very important. And then you've got a problem of le the legitimacy, because how do you achieve it? The, the best way so far is through a democracy. Indeed. But we know that democracy doesn't work all the time in the way you want to work. Well, indeed, the impasse that we have in the UK right now in relation to Brexit yeah. is, is a very keen illustration of the relative success or effectiveness of the Western model of democracy. By the same token, there's the recent development in Africa with the African Union of developing their own trading bloc, yeah. if you like, the equivalent of the EU. So for those states that are participating in that trading bloc, they're no longer going to be um, at the beck and core of either European or North American paymasters. Yeah. So that's demonstrating already in the here and now a long ago, you know, a 19th century vision yeah. for an emancipated African yeah, Absolutely. I and mean, that would be very continent. interesting to see a unified African continent. Yeah. Speaking not necessarily with one voice because we know this is not it's not possible, but at least not being at the mercy of the exploitations of other countries. Because absolutely. That's the case. Because otherwise they would and that's that's the problem. I mean we got a, a problem of scale here. And we the do. problem of scale is that any middle sized countries will have to get together because otherwise they will not be able to compete. That's the reason why Brexit is a suicidal thing. Yes, Europe is a neoliberal uh, proposition. Yes, but it's a, it's a neoliberal proposition which in certain ways is better than the neoliberal proposition proposed in the United States. Mm -hmm. Not quite that we don't know what it proposed in China. In China the proposition cannot work because of the number of people. Indeed. We, 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 we complain about China, but imagine if China allows people to start moving freely with 1.3 billion people. Imagine just 100 million people of Chinese just decided to leave the country. That would create a problem, immediate problem. Well, it would be huge. It so, would be huge. So again, part of what is um, in play here in the broad sense and in specific instances with respect to coloniality and decoloniality and decolonization is both at the personal level an emotional and psychological reinvention, reimagining of possibility, a resetting of relations. And as we scale that out from the individual into communities, into regions, and into nation states, it's a recognition that there is a patent injustice being undertaken on the part of the current and historically dominant political, economic, and military blocks. Let's, let's talk about semantics a little bit. This is, are, we, are we talking this about decolonization as, a, as an, in, an unjust act? Absolutely we are. Okay. Absolutely we are, because fundamentally it is an act of exploitation. And we talked about this a little bit in our first session together. It, you know, there are many facets, but one of the foremost facets is the denial and even at the most extreme the move to the erasure the extinction yeah. the deletion of an indigenous culture as if it is actually subhuman or inhuman so that fundamental premise carries through 
in the philosophy, in the epistemology, which we talked about in our initial yeah. session together. And we see that, whether that be in Syria, whether that be in terms of the saber rattling now taking place, partly between Britain and Iran, significantly between America and Iran, we see this trade war, which is fundamentally an ideological war of attrition between America and China. We see the ongoing uh, marginalized would-be might of Russia wanting to have a presence, wanting to be seen, perceived as a significant player on the international well, world it, 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 scene. Russia is a significant player in the world. Well, scene. well, now I would argue, but the, well, in the methodology is completely on what <laughs> is. But, <laughs> and, and this is this is what's so important. It's the question of what is the measure, and this is why I think there is great hope, because you know we've talked about China, we've talked about um, some of the South American states, and we've talked about some of the African states, and why I think there's great hope however far they're engaged in or enmeshed with the current version of a globalized economy is that they have somehow managed to continue to be connected in a meaningful way to their historical, cultural traditions and roots, notwithstanding the extent to which they are engaged in this globalized, Western constructed economic system. <laughs> well, I mean, they are. I mean, I've watched a few things on China, and I mean, yes, they're in the game. They're in the neoliberal Western capitalist game, but also they're very different how they govern. Yeah. You know, yeah. like in, I mean, I don't know, it's similar in Indonesia. They had used to until well, they had a dictator they imposed mm. in uh, Indonesia called Suharto. And the thing was unity, yeah. mm -hmm. unity amongst diversity. But you know, so effectively, it's very challenging for them, the Chinese. Um, it's Hong interesting Kong is challenging because they, they they really do fear in internal diversity mm -hmm. and difference. Mm -hmm. The Indians actually don't as much. They are more democratic and have a different way of doing it to a point. But the Chinese. Um, when when you refer to that. the Indians, do you mean the the continent of yeah. India, India, the country, state of India, India. No, the well, country of okay. India. Well, to a point, yes, mm. but even there, in, we, we've got this fundamental division between India and Pakistan. Yeah. Oh. And, and just well, in recent yeah. times, yeah, yeah, yeah. we, I mean, literally in recent days, we've got the issue Kashmir. of the Kashmir region. So again, wherever we look, there are which comes from yeah. partition, yeah, yeah, religion, exactly. and religion. Uh, well, but, the Brits were the ones who them. But moreover, the you know, that is, a, a, is a, in a way, I don't want to use the term perfect, um, because that, in a way, offers a certain um, credence and acceptability about the, the phenomenon. So what I would say is, it offers a very clear-cut illustration of coloniality, yeah. continuing even in a so-called post-colonial era. That those tensions are oh, yeah. so alive, so energized, and so um, so tinderbox. It's, it's, that's yeah. a kind of a downside of, of the fact that there's this tension in play. We're in this greater flux. Personally, I would still maintain there is great hope there is opportunity, and the, the key fact of our time, of our generation, is our relationship to planetary sustainability. For the first time in human time, at least in what we would refer to as the modern era, in the era whereby we have had recorded history, we potentially face extinction. It's a very real possibility. So I'm hopeful that the magnitude of that fact, both emotionally and conceptually, intellectually, is going to be a sufficient stimulus to shift the wider system. And 
as with all systems, whatever the input is, there's a delay before we have an output. So we can't know for certain how this will go. We can have a clear view about how we hope it will go, and we can make choices in our behavior as individuals, as consumers, as compañeros, yeah. where we hold solidarity with other groups, wherever they may be, that resonate with us. We can make those kinds of choices. So however much we've been told, however much we've almost been brainwashed, that there is no alternative, there is. clearly there is. You know, the nature of life in itself, beyond the human realm, is cooperation and diversification. That is the unfolding nature of life in the other than human domain, which is much vaster than the human domain. Yeah, yeah. the distribution of resources also is a big issue too. I mean, that, that way of thinking. The elimination of obscene wealth yes. and the grade and poverty, the elimination of that. Yes. That's, that's feasible. That's something that if the world can do. Absolutely. It's, it's, we have the, the, the tools, we have the, 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 the wealth, the collective wealth, and we want to do it. Who will do it? Who will take, who will take that stage? Well, that's a different case. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have all these alternatives. Yeah. And, um, you know, the word challenges comes up quite a bit, doesn't it? And yes. a, lot of, a lot of people, humans from all countries and all religions and colours and genders, some of them don't want to give give stuff up. Yeah. They don't want they to want give it away. Yeah. That's true. And when you challenge them, yes. they are, um, you often you'll get ridiculed mm -hmm. yeah. and you be seen to be dangerous. Yes. And then the third one, which um, I'm going to play with a bit is it becomes self-evident but I'd say the third one and the, the colonization process becomes they get rid of you right so well, that's and one history of the shows yeah. shows this and that's one of the mechanisms yeah. Patrice Lumumba the yeah. yeah and Africa a wonderful leader who some people say the Congo would be a very different place many people think they got rid of Gaddafi because he mm -hmm. wanted to create an African national bank the list goes on and on in other mm -hmm. parts of the world. So, but you know also, there are alternatives, and there are um, a greater awareness through the internet and consciousness. So, it is good to be optimistic, and this is true. This is true. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the whole idea that the world in the past yeah, was yeah. better than now is a fallacy, in spite of all the many, many problems that we face nowadays, which are complex and, and global. We live in a global world. We do. Our, glo our consciousness is global now, wanted, wanted or not. London is a paradigm of that, a city like London, where you see the world come into play. Like this. Yes. Uh, but but the, but the fundamental thing is that we live in a better world than in the past. I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of optimist. Right. Uh, more complicated, more complex, yes. because we're more aware of things. Indeed. Aware of what we're talking about, the decolonize. And decolonize is, is not only the term. The term has to be deconstructed in terms of political, economical, financial, intellectual, cultural, all those elements. People do not realize it is a process. Absolutely. And, and it, it, that's the point, really that it's not, a, it's not a destination, yeah. it's a process. Yeah. It's exactly, it, it, and, and historically they are not destination, like for example, um, the whole thing about um, multi-diversity, yes. you know, um, the multi-ethnic society. Yes. The multi-ethnic society is not a destination. It's not that we, no, it, it is a process by which we get there. At some Absolutely. point we would have to go there. Well, we're already there. We're already there. The, the we're issue. already there. And the issue is in which term we are getting there. Indeed. The Who could be represented and how are they represented? You were talking about the African Americans, for example, the disenfranchised, the political disenfranchise of African Americans mm -hmm. in the American electoral system. Something that the Republican Party has been doing for ages and ages and ages. What Absolutely. does it mean? The, the president gets three million votes less mm -hmm. than the second candidate, but they win. Indeed. So it, and you need to be aware of all those mechanisms. And, and this is one of the reasons to, to kind of loop back to where we began today in the context of anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. This process brings directly into our consciousness the extent 
of the complexity that we all face and that is unsettling in the beginning I would say it's even unsettling along the way has always been unsettling but better to better to be enlivened by that direct engagement with this incredibly rich diverse experience we call life than to live this narrow restricted and in inverted commas safe existence it's a half-life yeah yeah well i mean i don't think we've got anything else to really go with to today really i yeah. mean um unless you've got something no, no, I, I, I think we've got an agreement there. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have expanded on the idea. I mean, uh, if you look at it, in the first program we talked about the process of colonization and we were talking about China and how that process happened going to the west, not to the east, because in the east you have these great cultures, millionary cultures. So it was, a, and the Christian sort of kind of uh, uh, pinpoint, the, most, the Christianity sort of kind of the center of that process of expansion. Even you can look in, the, in the theological terms, in theological terms, look at Christianity. Christianity is a, is, a, is a religion of a straight line. Before birth, life, after death, a straight line. Look at, look at the East. The East is a question of the circle. You're getting out of the circle. But then the rebirth and the karma and going over and over. So just that, just that give you an idea why India went, went out there to colonize the world. China didn't do it either. We were talking about so the religion is a big, a big element of this process of colonization. And in this second program, we're talking about how to construct that. And I believe in this kind of kind of historiography element of that. That we need to rewrite history. Rich history needs to be rewritten constantly, all the time. Absolutely, history is not. It's not. It's not safe. And the past is not safe. And it's not done. And the past is not safe. Is. Exactly. The past is not safe. Yeah. Today. So. With that, thank you very much, Stuart. So uh, you really got your systemic constellations consultant in there. Oh, you know, I mean, uh, it's absolutely beautiful on point. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like thank everyone if you managed to get to the end of the program and watch us. We're very grateful for that. You can see us on ztrradio.podomatic.com. Um, we'd like to thank John Anthony Richardson Paintings, a director, for uh, chaperoning, directing us, and I'm training us the in a style too. as well. And until next time, and we'd like to also thank uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres. Yes. Got that. Got three different spellings here today, guys. Um, <laughs> Big for being a huge brain. Yeah. And we hope to see you next time for Theses 3, 4, and 5. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good.